this panel will be moderated by um, Dr. Alex Free. Dr. Free has received a PhD in environmental chemistry from UC Riverside and is currently the research and fellowship coordinator at the Minnesota Sea Grant. He's the lead author of two articles on dust sources in the Salton Sea Basin. Dr. Free. Thank you, Michael. Um, I greatly appreciate you know, the opportunity to moderate today. Um, I'm going to start today with a little outline. So um, we're going to do about a 10-minute introduction to the Salton Sea um, and the dust there emissions. And then we're going to hear from our speakers, um, Dr. Romano Evan, Brian Schmidt, and Jessica Humes, Stephen Garcia, and Stephen Garcia. And then we will have a short question and answer session. Uh, if you have questions during, uh, during the talks or during the introduction, please feel free to put them into the chat. And then when we reach the question and answer session, I will then ask the speakers um, specific questions. So please use that question and answer question. It makes it um, way more fun to moderate when we have questions um, coming from the audience as well. So today we're gonna to talk about the Salton Sea. So I believe many of you are likely familiar with the Salton Sea. It is the second largest lake west of the Mississippi and it is located north of the Mexico, Cal of Mexico, yeah, California and United States border. And the Salton Sea is a very large lake and we are concerned about it, particularly because it is a shrinking lake due to water management decisions and increasing water conservation in the Imperial Valley. Um, the Salton Sea has been shrinking um, for the last decade or so, um, leading to lake bed exposures um, that, that expose a lake bed that's known as Playa. Um, and Playa is something that, sorry, excuse me. Playa is often in many cases a significant dust source. So currently there is almost 29 square miles of unmanaged um, playa exposed at the Salton Sea that's potentially um, contributing dust emissions in the Salton Sea Basin. So we're particularly concerned, or, sorry, this is just an example of what that may look like if you haven't been to the Salton Sea and had an opportunity to see some of these dry lake beds yourself. Um, they really are a sight to be see, to behold because it's just huge swaths of land um, that where the sea has receded, um, leaving these playas. And to demonstrate why we're concerned about these as potential dust sources, um, although these services are quite dynamic, where you really have really different features at different times of the year and even different times of the day, um, I have a short video here that was taken in 2018. We can really see how soft some of these playas can be um, at certain times. Um, and this is really why well, one of the large reasons they're concerned about them in the context of dust is because they can be really large sources of dust under the right conditions. Um, and so we are concerned about that for multiple reasons, um, but the major reason um, that many people are worried about it is because of air quality. So when particles or particulate matter is emitted into the atmosphere, um, it reduces air quality. People who breathe air that has lots of particles in it um, have poorer health. They can sometimes have asthma. Um, they sometimes have cardiovascular diseases and often have um, worse, health comes, worse, health, worse health outcomes if they're exposed over the course of their life. And so particularly matter pollution um, is an issue and, has, and can lead to poor health in communities. So the Salton Sea is, an is in the Imperial Valley, and this is an area where particulate matter pollution has been bad historically and did not meet air quality standards. So you can see here that the Coachella Valley in the Imperial Valley here um, were not attainment. So this simply means that they did not meet particulate matter um, air quality standards um, even before the Salton Sea started to um, shrink. So we're essentially looking at what is potentially a large dust source um, in an area that already has challenges for particulate matter air quality. Um, and some people have used this as an example of the poor air quality in the Salton Sea Basin. Um, so this is just an image um, from an article um, that shows the relative emergency room visits between Imperial County um, and the whole of California. And you can see here for children, um, you're seeing about twi twice the frequency for asthma-related emergency room visits for children. And so that that is an indicator of poor air quality. So just to summarize here, we're looking at a region that has a shrinking, very large lake um, that, is that is revealing this lake bed that is potentially a large emission source um, that potentially is making air, that could potentially make air quality worse. And so um, what, what we'll hear from our experts today 
um, a little bit more about the dust science, about the mitigation um, techniques that are out there, and about the potential for, for current and future dust emissions here. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce our speakers. So I'm actually going to introduce all of our speakers here um, at once, and then we'll move through each one of their um, talks. So again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat, and we will get to them during the question and answer session at the end. So our first speaker is Dr. Amato Evan. Dr. Dr. Evan is a professor of climate sciences at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Evan's group studies the processes in the atmosphere in, at the Earth's surface, including working to understand dust in the atmosphere. Dr. Evan's recent work has included modeling and measurement of dust storms in the Salton Sea Basin. Today, Dr. Evan will provide a conceptual overview of dust emissions and recent research at the Salton Sea Basin. After learning about um, or hearing from Dr. Evan, we will hear from Brian Schmidt um, and Jessica Humes. Brian Schmidt is a quantitative so soil ecologist and agronomist for Formation Environmental, who has experience working on, on lake plyos around the world. Brian has consulted on dust mitigation of the Salton Sea for over 15 years. Today, Brian will overview soil types and emissions, emissions from different sites, and recent and predicted future emissions at the Salton Sea. Brian will be joined by Jessica Humes. Jessica Humes is a environmental project manager for the Imperial Litigation District. Humes currently leads, currently leads the IID environmental mitigation section responsible for implementing mitigation measures associated with the quantification settlement agreement, water transfer, and water department operations and maintenance activities. Um, after we hear from Brian and Jessica, we will hear from Stephen Garcia. Stephen Garcia is a, an, a senior engineer at the California Department of Water Resources. Stephen coordinates the engineering design and implementation of vegetation in enhancement and dust suppression projects at the Salton Sea as part of the Salton Sea Management Program. Today, Stephen will speak about dust management techniques and emissions at Salton Sea Management Program sites before and after treatment and management. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and hand it over to Dr. Evan. Okay, thank you. Let me get my slides going here. All right, great. So thanks for the opportunity to come attend this webinar and give you a, um, a little bit of an, an overview of some of the work that um, I have been doing out in the Salton Sea region. And uh, again, yeah, I'm a professor at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is the part of, uh, part of University of California, San Diego. And specifically, I'm interested in dust storms. Now, uh, what is a dust storm? Uh, here's an image of a dust storm that I, uh, or a video of a dust storm I made a couple months ago with a student while we were out um, just west of the Salton Sea. And what you're looking at here is along this dry lake bed, sand and, uh, is moving across the surface. It's being picked up by the winds and, and just traveling uh, along this dry stream bed. And I think if, if you were out there, you know, we're looking at sand, these are kind of larger particles. Dust particles are smaller, the ones that actually kind of get lofted up into the atmosphere. And if you were standing where I was, you know, it looks like most of the particles that are moving are by the surface, but actually you'd be noticing that there's all kinds of tiny particles getting in your ears or maybe between your teeth. Those are the dust particles. Those are the ones that are, are you know, have sizes maybe about diameters that are roughly uh, the width of a human hair or 10 times smaller, or maybe even 100 times smaller than that. You need a couple ingredients for a dust storm. Firstly, you need a, a source like this dry stream bed right here of, of uh, fine material that can be lifted up in the atmosphere. Dry stream beds and dry lake beds are really excellent dust sources because there's a lot, they're filled with a lot of fine sediment. We also need strong winds, which you can see by the, indicate by the, the vegetation in the background moving. Um, we need some kind of energy that actually can be uh, uh, deposited to those particles to, to liberate them from the surface. We also need dry surfaces. If, if the soil is wet, then it's not going to be lifted up into the atmosphere. And, Deserts are pretty good sources of dry surfaces. Um, and then along the surface, we don't want anything that's going to slow down the wind. Could be vegetation, but that could be rocks, um, any type of surface that's non-emissive. So again, right here, we've got all of those ingredients. We've got winds, we've got a dry surface, we've got a source of uh, uh, ample um, fine sediments to be lifted up in the air. And we've got kind of this nice long area where the wind speed can build up and, and lift those particles into the atmosphere. So dust storms are, are ubiquitous in, our, in the state of California. 
Um, I've got a couple images here over of, of dust storms, um, for example. So at left, we've got a dust storm that's traveling northwest to southeast through the San Joaquin Valley. Um, at the upper right hand corner, there's an image of a dust storm that's along the eastern Sierras in the uh, Owens Valley. And the dust is indicated um, by these, uh, uh, what looks almost like smoke lifting up from the atmosphere um, underneath these clouds. And that indeed is dust. The bottom right, we have an image of a, a famous dust storm from Bakersfield and I think it was 1977. Uh, a violent windstorm that produced gusts up to 100 miles an hour and, and generated this wall of dust that you can see in the image um, that probably was several kilometers in height. So maybe five, six, 7,000 feet uh, uh, vertical extent. Um, really one of the more extreme cases of a dust storm that, that was recorded at least in North America. But among all those places, I, you know, I suspect the Salton Sea region might be one of the dustiest. And uh, I built a field site in, 2019, and its location is indicated by that peach colored box. Um, because I was interested in dust storms there, I wanted to study um, how the environment was changing. Um, and then also, maybe more academically, I think we can learn a lot about dust storms around planet Earth by being able to, to study what's happening in this one region. Now, like I said, I think there are a lot of dust storms in, in the Salton Sea. I suspect it might be one of the dustiest places in California, potentially North America. Um, so we looked at our data, the measurements that we make, and they include measurements both of, of meteorology and, and aerosols, which is a generic term for any particle that's in the atmosphere, uh, but not only at the surface, but where they are throughout the entire depth of the atmosphere. Um, and so we used our data to indicate what I'll call major dust storms, large dust events. Um, and from 2020 through 2022, we estimated that there was about one dust storm every six days which is a pretty astonishingly high number of, of dust outbreaks or of dust storms. And again, this was at my field site. And if we dig into that data, I, I classify those dust storms as, as being either winter time dust storms or winter storms or haboobs. And the difference between those two, I think tells us a little bit about uh, who is impacted by those dust storms and potentially how they might change in the future. So what do I mean by these winter storms? Well, here's a satellite animation of one of these winter time, what I'm calling a winter time dust storm. And so in the center of the image, you can see the Salton Sea and there's streams of dust traveling across the sea. Um, and you, you can tell that there's dust just because it looks a little bit more brown, right? And so there's actually dust around the desert regions to the west of the sea, traveling south across the um, agricultural areas as well just a little bit harder to see from satellite. It's easier to see dust when it's you know, over the top of something dark like the Salton Sea. Now, if you look at the left-hand side of the image and you kind of use your hands to trace out those clouds, um, you get a sense that the clouds are moving in a counterclockwise fashion. We would call that cyclonically. And what that is, is this is just a really large wintertime storms. These are the same, same types of storms in the winter or the spring that bring precipitation to the coastal ranges or maybe snowfall to the Sierras. But when they impact the desert regions of our state, oftentimes what happens is those storms move across, like in this case, the coastal range where they're precipitating. There are a lot of clouds, there's a lot of rainfall. By the time those storms then pass over the crest of those mountains, they are now devoid of a lot of their moisture, which means we still have strong winds, we still have cool air associated with these storms, but we don't have the precipitation. And again, that's just a really good ingredient to create a dust storm, strong winds, um, and it's dry. And most of the dust storms in the region are of this type. They're associated with these large scale, we'll we sometimes call them synoptic weather uh, patterns, but these large scale weather systems that move across the state. And what I think is important to note is, again, these are the most common types of dust storms. And generally they're associated with winds that travel from west to east or from north to south. So if you happen to live to the south or to the east, of any of these areas that are emitting dust, you're probably most impacted by these types of storms. Now, in contrast, the other type of storm we have is a haboob, okay? And a haboob dust storm, these are dust storms that generally occur in the summertime season. So let's say July through September, but potentially into August and potentially um, as early as June. 
And haboobs are really dramatic dust storms. Now you may not know, but the Salton Sea region is actually a monsoon region. And what that means is every summer moisture, uh, warm and moist air is being sucked up from the Gulf of California, the Sea of Cortez into the Salton Basin. And under the right conditions, all of that moisture and all of that warm air is, uh, generates what's called a, a, a large thunderstorm or a mesoscale convective system. And so we get these huge thunderstorms out over the desert that then rain over the desert. And that rain, because it's raining over a dry region, ends up evaporating. And when that rain evaporates, it cools and it slams down into the ground and it creates this uh, uh, area of high winds that propagate out radially from the center of that storm. And if those high winds, those really strong surface winds move over a dry soil region, then you can create dust. So this is a haboob from uh, October of last year. And we see this really well-defined, what we'll call that a dust front, this leading edge of the dust. Um, and uh, the dust is obviously indicated by the, the brown colors. Over the top of the dust, we have some clouds. Um, and then in the background of the image, you can see this, this large area of maybe a slightly less um, structured clouds. It looks maybe a little more uh, um, cottony, if you wanna say. That's the remnants of the original thunderstorm that created this event. And so where we are here is we're at the Northern end of the Salton Sea and we're looking South. And what's happening is that dust front is traveling northward um, up into the Coachella Valley. And so this is, and, and in fact, this particular storm ended up in Palm Springs. It was, it was probably at least the largest dust storm I had seen in the area that, that traveled up into the Coachella Valley, at least in the last five years since I've been trying to pay attention to the characteristics of dust storms there. But what I think is very uh, important to understand about Haboobs is these types of dust storms can, whereas with the wintertime dust storms, primarily the, primarily the wind is out of the west or it's out of the north. With haboobs, the wind is every direction. We can have these dust storms traveling from south to north, from north to south. Sometimes these dust storms are generated closer to the California-Arizona border and they travel westward over the Salton Sea region or they travel from west to east. They're very difficult to predict. They're highly variable. Um, both on daily time scales, but then also on seasonal time scales. So probably one of the most relevant questions to the work that I'm hoping to accomplish out of the Salton Sea is, is to address this question, right? Well, the Salton Sea is in decline, will there be more dust? And I should say, this is the easiest question, right? Because if we look at other examples, we know you take a, dry, you take a lake in an arid region, you dry it out and you create dust storms. Um, it's just a really great place to uh, uh, have strong winds and an available supply of fine sediment re ready to be lofted up into the atmosphere. So this is the case, the Owens Dry Lake. So we're looking at the Eastern Sierras. It used to be Owens Lake. In the early 20th century, water was diverted. The runoff from the Eastern Sierras was diverted uh, southward towards Los Angeles or into Los Angeles. And we resulted with uh, the now Owens Dry Lake bed and this is a great dust source region. I know there are a lot of efforts to try to manage the dust from this area, but nevertheless, um, and this is a, a dust source and it does emit quite a bit of dust if management uh, activities are not undertaken. And so this is an image of one such dust storm, all of this, this white cloud that's basically being lifted up from the surface, that's actually soil, um, that playa, uh, uh, the soils on the playa that are, are being lifted up into the atmosphere and uh, that is being capped off by these uh, lenticular clouds. Um, we can look at other regions of the world as well. So this is the Aral Sea. Aral Sea is one of the, was one of the world's largest inland bodies of water. Uh, it resides in Central Asia. And in the 1970s, the Soviet Union um, decided to divert water runoff from the Himalayas or into the um, arid region surrounding the Aral Sea in order to cultivate cotton. Um, and that resulted in a reduction of water going into the Aral Sea um, and a shrinking of the Aral Sea to the point where in the 80s, there was a North and South Aral Sea. And going into the 2000s, that Southern Aral Sea um, ended up splitting into a Western and an Eastern half. And until at this point where that whole uh, Eastern half of the Southern Aral Sea is now gone. And again, we have a, a large surface loaded with fine materials, very flat, no vegetation. And, and of course it becomes a, a, a pretty significant source of dust for that area. 
And here we're looking at a dust storm generated by strong winds. And you really can get a sense that that soil is being lifted off the surface by the texture um, of the, um, the uh, that we can see in this satellite image and as well as just this kind of whitish cloud that's uh, essentially being generated on the right-hand side of the image and traveling down towards the lower left-hand corner. So I, I guess the, the more relevant question is how much is dust going to increase? As the salt and sea shrinks, it's, it's going to get more dusty, um, at least in those areas where there's no management happening. Um, and so one thing we can do is look at satellite measurements. It, it, it's incredibly difficult to find trends in, uh, in any kind of meteorological or any type of phenomena that happens uh, on Earth. And, and that's because we have just a lot of noise. We have a lot of weather. We have a lot of random variability. And, and it's hard as well, specifically with dust. Dust is incredibly hard to measure in so many ways. Um, satellites give us an opportunity to do that in a homogeneous way. And what we're looking at here is a, a time series of, of dustiness over the Salton Basin from two satellites. One satellite is indicated by these blue circles and data from the other satellite is indicated by these uh, brown triangles. And the, where we are in the vertical dimension on this plot, that just indicates if it's more dusty or less dusty. And what we see from these two different satellites from the period of 2003 um, till 2018 is that there has been an increase in dust. Um, and, and so much so though that we would estimate a, a doubling of the amount of dust in the area on timescales of about 20 to 30 years, which is pretty dramatic. Um, now, I just want to caution that we should take these measurements with a grain of salt, maybe a big grain of salt, um, because again, it's very difficult to see dust in a satellite. And you'll notice that my time series only goes up to 2018, because that's when I had some people that were able to, to try to solve this problem for me. If we just take any satellite data and look over the area, it, it's not going to give us anything reliable. We really need to do a lot of work with that satellite data to try to tease out that dust signal. Um, but besides, you know, that we, we know that dust is increasing and, and we have at least one estimate, you know, that it's increasing pretty dramatically, you know, I think then the relevant question to me is, well, where is it going to be changing the, the most? Or, or maybe more specifically, who's going to be impacted the most? And those are incredibly difficult questions to answer. Um, and there's a tendency that I've noticed uh, to assume that, well, we have PM10 measurements all over the area, and, and maybe those PM10 measurements, and, and PM10 measurement, I'm, I'm sorry, it's an in, instruments, we have a series of instruments all over the, the, the region that are measuring kind of particulates, essentially dust in the air, uh, the really small particles. And those, while those instruments are really useful, they can't really give us the kind of information that we need just yet. One problem is that oftentimes they don't work and, and sometimes these instruments fail during the dust storm. It's the time that we need them just because they get overloaded, they get saturated with the amount of particulate that they're measuring. Um, the other reason though is, is that just, again, the weather is highly variable. We have these PM measurements going back maybe in some stations two, three years, maybe in others five or six, um, but we really need a long time series to be able to pick out the weather from this signal that we're looking at, maybe this long-term but slow secular increase in dust. And just as an example, you know, if we were to look at the summer of 2021 and the summer of 2022, 2021 was a very inactive monsoon season. And so what we're looking at is a time series of dust and just everywhere where there's a shaded bar, that just indicates we measured a dust storm. We, we, we noted that there was a dust storm and it was one of these haboobs. We look at 2022, it was a very active monsoon season. There were very, there were quite a bit more haboobs, even 2023, quite a bit more. And if we were just to look at this PM10 data or, or just some measurements and look at over these three years, we might falsely conclude, oh, well, there's this huge increase in dust over this three year period and it's because the Salton Sea is shrinking. Well, in reality, it, it, it's actually because of natural causes because of monsoon variability, which, which again, it's, um, it's just random weather variability. So, you know, in reality, the computer models are going to be our best option to answer those really fundamental and super important questions. Um, and, and I just want to throw out one more thing. Computer models are really difficult um, to uh, use. And, and my the way that I would communicate what a computer model is like is, is this very complicated um, control room, where in a computer model, you have so many different knobs that you can turn. Um, and you're always going to get an answer out of a computer model 
And we really only should trust a computer model if we understand why it's doing the things that it's doing, if we can evaluate it. And, and for me, the best way to do that is we have to understand the physical processes. Once we understand the physical processes that are happening, for example, we have winter dust storms, we have these haboob storms, they're very different. Can our model simulate those very different types of systems? In that case, then we start to have a little confidence in our model and then we can start to ask our model questions like what's going to happen in 10 years if the sea shrinks you know, by 50%. That's not an easy thing to do and I'm gonna end here uh, precisely because of what's in this picture. Uh, so it, at least this is one reason why. What we're looking at here is uh, uh, an image taken from Split Mountain from a, a 360 degree camera. And you can see in the background kind of along the horizon, uh, dust in the atmosphere. But we can also see a rainbow, which means that, that it's also raining in that scene. So simultaneously, we have a dust storm and a rainstorm. And I think that just typifies the complexity of the region. Um, and that's why, to me, no one's come out and been able to say, this is exactly how dust is going to change. This is um, if we do this thing or if we do that thing. And here are the people that are going to be affected because it's just such an incredibly challenging problem to solve. So I will end there for now. Sorry, I went a little over. Brian, I think you can go whenever you're ready. So. Okay. Well, thanks, Model, for that uh, great kind of introduction to the processes that are going on uh, within the Salton Basin and other similar basins. Um, I'm getting my uh, presentation started here. I'm going to let Jessica go first in terms of uh, giving some background on the Salt Sea Air Quality Mitigation Program. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, so I'm Jessica Humes. I'm the Environmental Project Manager here at IID. Um, we have been working with formation, um, or at least Brian, 2005. Does that sound right, Brian? That's correct. Um, and so as part of the quantification settlement agreement, we do have specific mitigation measures um, related to the salt and sea air quality um, other things as well, um, burrowing owls, desert pupfish, um, flat-tailed horn lizards. We have a whole list of, of other mitigation measures, but our, our big one, um, and the one that Brian's gonna talk about today is our air quality mitigation program. Um, it is funded by the Quantification Settlement Agreement Joint Powers Authority. So that's IID, Coachella Valley Water District, San Diego County Water Authority, and then California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, all put in funding to implement mitigation measures, um, not just at the sea, but all of those larger mitigation measures as well. Um, so today, Brian is going to talk about our program. It is a comprehensive, comprehensive science-based adaptive program um, that comes out of the EIR EIS for the QSA. Um, and with that, Brian, I'll give it to you. Yeah. Thanks, Jessica. So as, as Jessica mentioned, the whole kind of basis of the program is to proactively detect, locate, assess, and identify options to mitigate dust emissions from exposed salt and sea playa. Uh, when we talk about the air quality program, we talk about kind of the, the three main pillars. We're going to be, you know, my presentation today is going to be focused mainly on this first pillar, which is the current emissions and annual emissions estimate. Um, the other pillars include, you know, once we understand where the emissions are coming from on an annual basis, then planning and designing dust control, working with stakeholders, and then ultimately the last pillar uh, is implementing and monitoring the, the, the control measures that have been installed. Uh, so when it comes to that first uh, pillar, uh, understanding current emissions, um, there's kind of four main objectives. It's pretty simple. Where and when do dust emissions occur? When there are dust emissions, how much is emitted? When the dust is emitted, where does that plume go? Uh, where does it travel? And then based on all of that information, which areas of playa should be prioritized for dust control? So we talked about this first pillar. There's really uh, kind of four steps. It starts with mapping playa exposure, 
characterizing the surfaces. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, all the surfaces are created equal. Some are more emissive than others. So we want to make sure we understand as that playa is exposed, how those surfaces evolve. Um, uh, and during that kind of, as they're exposed for a longer period. Ultimately, not all winds uh, are also kind of the same across all different parts of the playa. Some areas um, consistently have stronger uh, winds on an, on an annual basis. And then ultimately wrapping that all into understanding emissions. So that first step of mapping pie exposure, this is from end of year 2022. So each year there's a cyclic uh, a cycle of highs and lows in terms of the sea elevation, uh, but generally the trend is, is down as, as we've talked about. We typically pick the lower end of that cycle. So uh, we uh, get satellite imagery during that lower period, um, look at the actual pie exposure uh, so at the end of 2022, um, there were a total of 30,400, uh, just shy of 30,500 acres of exposed playa. One of the things you'll notice is there's a lot of um, green areas out here. This is uh, playa vegetation. So a lot of the areas are naturally vegetating, uh, generally around um, where drainage flows onto the playa uh, and, and, and uh, creates an environment where vegetation can expand. There's also pools, um, sheet flow. Uh, so in terms of kind of the open playa, so uh, areas that are, you know, um, potentially uh, emissive, uh, there's about 22,000 acres at the end of uh, 2022 of the total 30,500 ex exposed. And again, this trend has been going up um, uh, since the, the QSA, uh, uh, but I think one of the important things to, to kind of consider is, you know, based on projections that were done previously, we're about 10,000 acres less than we anticipated we would be at um, right now for a variety of reasons. Um, but we do anticipate that, uh, you know, with everything that's going on, that, that uh, we'll, you know, we'll catch up pretty quickly. So the whole goal is that as playa is actually exposed, we're characterizing these surfaces. We use a variety of different tools. Um, we look at uh, you know, emission rates. So generally how the playa changes through time and space. Um, with the pie swirl, uh, we have sand motion monitors. Generally, uh, you need that abrasion agent, which is the sand for saltation. Uh, so we, we monitor sand uh, motion on, on several different areas. The, the surfaces are very dynamic out there. So we monitor those surface conditions through time, soil moisture changes also. Um, we look not only at the, at the surface, but the subsurface, because that gives us clues on what type of crust we might, um, we might develop, as well as uh, uh, what type of dust control measures might be suitable. And then we have different air quality monitoring stations, the TEOMS, uh, which Evan showed in, uh, our, our model showed in his, uh, presentation, we have six of those, and then other different tools to, to help us understand um, uh, conditions around the salt in the basin. So here's again, just kind of a snapshot of our of our air quality monitoring stations, so TEOMS, six of those around the sea, uh, meteorological towers to help us understand wind conditions, and then a series of cameras to help us understand, um, you know, kind of keep eyes on different areas to understand visually what's going on in terms of dust production. So at the end of the day, we wrap all this into a model um, to estimate emissions, not only from salt and sea, so the, the playa uh, here, but also the desert to the west of the salt and sea. And when you aggregate those, uh, those totals on an annual basis, basis, what you'll see is that the green bar is the desert, the blue bar is the playa. And the whole goal of the program is to keep that blue bar as small as possible. Uh, to keep that uh, from growing uh, over time as salt and sea as the salt and sea playa expands, um, we we do monitor the desert because that's a, a very large source. To put that into perspective, um, this it's right upwind of the of the playa. It becomes very difficult to determine what's coming from the desert versus what's coming from the playa. So our program is designed to to quantify both uh, for that reason. Uh, but ultimately, what you see is that it ranges anywhere from, you know, 15,000 to 30,000 tons per year. 
uh, that's almost in the same ballpark as Owens Lake pre-control um, before control measures were there. So there's definitely a lot of dust in the basin. Um, I think, uh, you know, our focus and our goal is really focusing on the blue bar down here. And like I said, again, making it, uh, keeping it as, as small as possible. So ultimately we put this into all this information into a dispersion model. Um, on the left, you have uh, uh, emissions from the desert on uh, April 21st, 2021. On the right, you have uh, just the emissions from the playa on that same date. And again, you can start to see uh, the magnitude of the two uh, sources. Uh, but what it allows us to do is really focus on the areas uh, on the right-hand side uh, in terms of um, prioritizing for dust control. In terms of this whole process, we spent a lot of time developing it, a lot of uh, scientific contribution, a lot of um, instrumentation, a lot of studies. Uh, ultimately, we went through the peer review process. The goal was to obtain an independent review of the, of the product, you know, what we, the emissions estimate from experts who hadn't contributed to its development. We, we followed the EPA Science and Technology Policy Council's uh, peer review handbook um, and documented that review. We got uh, from four different uh, reviewers, we received about 180 comments. All of those have been uh, documented, our response. And then ultimately the goal is to continue to make the, um, the process uh, and, the, and the estimate of emissions better. As Amato said, this is you know, a very difficult process to quantify. Um, and our goal is to incrementally continue to uh, reduce the uncertainty uh, in, our, in our estimates and ultimately, you know, again, have this information be used to prioritize where projects should be placed on the file. Uh, in addition, we've um, also went through the peer review process in terms of publications and manuscripts. There's two of them that are out there that were um, in 2022 and 2023. And then uh, a, a revised one that we submitted in, in June of 2023, um, talking about the, the overall integration of, the, of all of these um, different uh, data sets into a model and ultimately uh, performance of that model. But ultimately the goal is to, again, use this information to prioritize where the most emissive areas are and prioritize those for dust control proactive dust control implementation. Um, I think uh, what's interesting is that as you start to look at these areas, you can rank them from high to low. So we can look at the, the top 5% of the playa that's contributing the most emissions that um, is about 1200 acres and contributes 32% uh, of all emissions from the playa. So again, what this is saying is not all areas are emissive, but there are areas that um, you know, contribute more to the overall emissions from the playa. And if I could keep going down through this, 10% uh, contributes over 50% of total emissions, 15%, 64, 20, 75, 25, 82. But ultimately, as you kind of get you know, higher in that curve, there's less and less return on your investment in terms of reduction in emissions. So if you think about it from this perspective, um, the, the orange area being that 30% of playa contributing 88% of all emissions um, from, the, from the playa, um, you know, those are the areas that we're really uh, identifying and recommending for proactive dust control implementation. So again, uh, this is an annual five-year estimate. Uh, the warmer the colors, the higher the emissions, the, um, the greener the color, the lower the emissions on the left-hand panel here. And on the right-hand panel, we have sort of existing and planned dust control. And they're in different phases and different buckets, if you will. This first bucket right here, um, about 7,000 acres that are implemented projects or in active construction. The orange bucket in the middle here is about 3,000 acres of areas that have identified for um, projects but are still in the planning and uh, uh, initial concept phase. And then ultimately this lower bucket is projects that are planned um, and are in that uh, uh, design and implementation phase. So again, the whole goal is using your emissions, planning those projects to keep this blue bar as, as low as, as possible. And again, this is just an example using that same animation. 
these are your um, emissions on uh, May 8th, 2022 is another big uh, dust event. You have your desert over here. Again, that's your upwind source not associated with the project. You have the sources coming from the playa, and this is on a 24 hour basis. And then with those kind of planned and future projects, uh, you know, put on top uh, with the, you know, assumed control efficiency, which Stephen will talk about, you really reduce um, the uh, amount of emissions and where those emissions are going. So this is kind of from left to right, just kind of shows you, you know, the desert or background, the playa uh, uncontrolled, and then the playa controlled with those planned projects. In terms of future challenges, um, uh, again, on the left, we have our five years of, of annual emissions. When we kind of project out, one of the things that we notice is there's certain parts of the playa that, um, you know, kind of year in and year out have higher emissions potential. And we anticipate that will continue into the future. Um, so it's really along the west side here, the areas that we call clubhouse, uh, Tule Fan, Naval Test Base. Those are areas that, uh, you know, and uh, we want to make sure that in those planning domains in the future, we continue to keep an eye on these. We continue to monitor how that ply exposure accelerates because what we're what we're seeing there is that that's where our highest emission potentials are along the west side. Along the west side, we also have limited water resources. So this on the top uh, left over here. Uh, on the south end, we have water resources in terms of, you know, water for doing uh, water-based dust control on both the south, east, and north side. But on the west side, we really don't have um, uh, access to uh, drainage or other, other water supplies. That's also the area that interfaces with the desert and, and the upwind sources that I showed previously. Um, you know, we have encroachment uh, onto the playa of sand dunes from the desert. Uh, we also have uh, both, you know, alluvial and fluvial deposits. So sand coming down in dry washes during uh, uh, thunderstorm uh, flash flood events that then make their way onto the playa and our deposit on the playa, make that playa more emissive. Um, and then we have uh, aeolian processes of actually like sand dune migration onto the playa. And what we found is that where these sand dunes are coming onto the playa, you know, it's about three, the, the playa where that sand dune and surrounding areas um, are, are impacted by the sand, it's about three times more emissive than it would be if that sand wasn't coming onto the playa. So, but, you know, in that video that uh, Amato showed where um, you have that sand kind of uh, cascading uh, and saltating uh, with the wind, that's really the, the abrasion agent that lofts that finer particulate matter into the air. And, um, you know, that, that access and that migration of sand onto the playa really is a concern that, um, you know, future playa emissions in those areas could be higher than they would be if that wasn't happening. In these areas, we're also um, planning for uh, groundwater um, uh, testing for uh, um, groundwater supply. So we have several test wells and uh, either planned or implemented. So we've um, put four test wells up in the clubhouse area. The whole goal is to get access to a reliable water supply that could be used to expand vegetation in these areas. Um, without access to water in these areas uh, because of the sandy nature of the soil, um, you know, there's limited options. Uh, it's really vegetation is our um, is is one of the key kind of dust control measures that's that's suitable for these areas. That's really needed, and and again, access to water is a, is a critical path item. So uh, we're focusing those kind of near term groundwater development projects in San Felipe and Clubhouse areas. In terms of kind of planning for future ply exposure, so um, both in terms of you know, what types of soils and, and what type of suitability for different dust control measures might be, as well as, um, you know, building analogs uh, in terms of what that future soil condition, what types of emissions we might anticipate based on what we see now um, from currently exposed areas. So we have um, a lot of soils information in the yellow 
uh, out here from terrestrial or the current exposed bio. Um, recently, we did some subaqueous coring uh, out in the future exposed bio, so out into that fringe and that kind of uh, where we anticipate the plant exposure will be, especially on the west and south uh, sides. Um, uh, you know, and these are just some some photos of kind of the, the challenging conditions of pulling cores, both um, on the terrestrial side and, and then on the subaqueous side. Ultimately, we can, you know, we're starting to now use this information to, to understand what those future soil conditions might look like, and then ultimately how they might be used in terms of planning for future dust control. Uh, this is just one example of some of the analytics that are coming from that. Um, what we see here is that the, the darker the color, so the, the reddish and, and brownish colors are high silt and clay content, so those are fine textured soils. Those are soils that um, are going to be suitable for dust control um, with respect to surface roughening. They also, um, because they're finer textured at the surface, could also be suitable for more water-based um, measures in terms of uh, ponds and, and habitat. Uh, the greener areas, these are the areas that, uh, you know, are, are more challenging. So they're finer textured soils, or I'm sorry, coarser textured soils. So they're more sandy in nature and um, definitely uh, require water in terms of either, you know, suppressing the, the, um, the future emissions with vegetation, with other water-based measures. So, um, Again, we're just kind of getting started on this, but um, our goal is to kind of use this information from uh, kind of long-term planning um, uh, tool to assess future soil conditions and how they might relate to both emissions and um, uh, potential dust control measure suitability. So uh, with that, um, thank you. Honorable, thank you, Brian. Um, again, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Stephen. Hi there. Good afternoon. Are you guys hearing me okay? All right. Hi, my name is Stephen Garcia. I'm a senior engineer with the Department of Water Resources, and I'm here to talk to you about our uh, dust suppression projects, also their vegetation enhancement projects, and I'll get into that. Um, but the res the monitoring results we're seeing there and potential emission reductions uh, from those projects. And I also need to share my screen. Sorry about that. You should be able to kick Brian. Otherwise, Brian, you can. Is that, are we good now? Perfect. Okay. So um, as I alluded to, these are vegetation enhancement and dust suppression project sites. Uh, the state's goal is to vegetate um, our project areas to 30% vegetation to meet the Imperial County um, Air Pollution Control District's uh, BACM measure of 30% vegetation. Um, that is what we um, have come to agreement with them. So uh, to, to grow vegetation out there and to get them to a site so where they're actually going to do some dust suppression. It takes somewhere three to five years um, to get there, and the dust suppression, the dust problem, is a problem now. So, and and also um, the dust that's being created on the site is a problem for the plants as they grow. So, what we really want to do is get out onto our product sites and control that dust right away. And uh, the least expensive and the most efficient way we found in very very sandy soil areas which would be the, the areas on the west side of the Salton Sea is uh, to use bells and um, in other areas to use a mixture of bells and other surface roughening techniques. And what these techniques are meant to do is to essentially slow down the wind speed at the surface, which will also reduce the shear force that would uh, pick up dust or sand uh, along the surface. And, when uh, dust does pick up sand or soil on the surface, we call that saltation. And what saltation is, is um, that soil bouncing on the surface from wind, but what can happen from saltation is the soils will be bouncing and they'll break into smaller particles. And that's when we um, start seeing emissions from the site. 
So if we can prevent those particles uh, from bouncing around on our project sites, we can essentially prevent uh, emissions from going into the air. And so what these graphics represent is the large areas, large arrows are uh, high wind speeds. And um, on this left graphic, as it goes over, uh, you can see the wind is reduced. Um, and you can also see we represent the, the, the plants growing within the bells, which is actually occurring out there. We're also out there uh, vegetating these sites uh, in between the bells. And this right graphic shows um, an area that is uncontrolled. And there's, there's lots of uh, saltation occurring. And that saltation uh, will lead to the smaller particles and this, this large wind will carry it away. Uh, where, we're, where we're able to reduce um, the wind speed uh, at the surface with our, or with our roughness, uh, you can see we're, we're not seeing emissions. So these are graphical interpretations of how our uh, engineered roughness uh, works out there. And uh, also a thing to add that the bells are meant to be there, um, you know, quick measure for dust suppression and, and also temporary. Uh, we're planning to do something with them in the future. Uh, likely mulching them for the plants to really help them retain their moisture and um, survive out there. And here's just a few pictures of what it looks like out there in real life, what these bell arrays are, are doing. Um, the plan with these bells, and then also uh, we incorporate um, the ability to allow water to spread. Um, so these are on contour. Um, so meaning uh, these, these bells follow the slope of, of the salt and sea playa. Um, and then also they're in a staggered array uh, and they're the large face of the bell is facing the prevailing wind direction, which is the direction that we most expect the wind to come from. And staggering the bells like this um, allows for minimal um, through points. So when the wind's coming through, it really has something to uh, run into, slow down and slow it down and lose its energy. So it's not picking up dust from the site. Um, at our sites, uh, at, one of, at our clubhouse site, uh, the one we were just looking at, we have monitoring stations there. And we also have some monitoring stations at the northern shoreline of the sea. These are air quality and uh, meteorological stations. They measure uh, precipitation, humidity, wind speed and direction. They also measure PM10. Um, they actually can uh, measure an array of particulate matter sizes. And right now we're also going through to measure PM 2.5 as well to add to our data, data sets. Um, another thing that I wanna point out is uh, this rod right here, um, that's a salt, saltation measure. Um, that's something I was really talking about earlier and that's just a very important uh, item for us to measure to, to ensure that our sites are working. This is really what's gonna tell us if our sites are working during high wind events. Um, if we see a high wind event coming, but we're not seeing a lot of saltation during our site, we're, we're seeing you know, that, that the site's working, that the wind's being reduced and there's not movement of, of soil particles on the surface. And now we're gonna start looking at the air quality data, starting with uh, what we're seeing at the North Salt and Sea shoreline. We don't currently have products there. What we're doing is doing some preemptive monitoring to see, um, where the emissions are coming from, if these areas are potential source. So as you can see, we have four monitoring stations um, all the way from the west side to the east side of the northern uh, part of the shoreline of the sea. And so what I'm showing you now is wind speed and PM10 concentration on days where uh, there was an exceedance in the PM10 concentration uh, for federal and state 24 hour mean period. The federal uh, standard is 150 micrograms per meter cubed, whereas the state is uh, 50 micrograms per meter cubed. And over here, just kind of explain what we're seeing here. The wind speed um, is in increments of about 0.5, and uh, the slower the wind speed, the cooler the color, the higher the warmer, higher the wind speed, the higher. Similar for PM10 concentration, um, but these are in increments of 50 micrograms per meter. And to talk about the graphs a little bit, so this is the station near North Shore on the eastern side of uh, the, the Salton Sea shoreline. And on these exceeding days, we're seeing uh, the wind come from the Northwest. 
So that's what these wind roses show. They show the direction that the wind's coming from. And we can also see uh, the exceedance levels here. Uh, they're, they're really uh, going into 350 and higher in some of these events. So that's the station near North Shore. And I'm gonna go around and show you the other exceedance dates for um, the other stations on the North Shore line. So this one is the TMR, TMRN station. Um, this one, I believe, is closer to the Whitewater River um, stormwater channel. And we're seeing similar things on uh, high wind speed events, on high wind speed or high PM10 concentration events, that the wind speed is, again, coming from the northwest along with those high concentrations of PM10. And I believe we may have had more exceedance states at TMRN. Yes, we did. So here's a few more um, of those high concentration events that exceeded federal and or state standards. But we're seeing that predominant wind coming from the northwest with those high PM10 concentrations. And then here's the, the last station here is where we start seeing things get a little interesting. Uh, on these high PM10 concentration dates, we're seeing wind speeds, a lot of time coming straight from the west, um, but we do have these events that they're coming from the east as well. Um, and the concentrations are, are getting up there, but not as high as when they're coming from the west side, what we can see from those. So without drawing too many conclusions, we, we're seeing similar similar results from these stations, and that is a lot of the wind is coming from uh, the west to northwest, carrying those high PM10 concentrations. So moving on to the air quality monitoring at Clubhouse, this is where we have the Bell Array set up, and we have two transects of those monitoring stations I was talking about. And here's um, a table of data from 2022. These are the total number of minutes during these months of saltation. So this is the number of minutes we had soil moving across um, the surface of our pro within our project array. Um, and I think, and the most we see here is in April of you know six hours, about or eight hours for the total month um, of, of April. And then looking at the total flux, um, March is the only time where you can actually see an increase. And remember, this is for the whole month. So these are grams per meter. And so for the whole month, there was only nine grams uh, coming onto the site. However, 42 grams did leave the site, which is very, it's just a very small, uh, we want to say insignificant number, um, especially when you see the these other high um, totals of 17,000 grams, 2,000 grams, and then they're also being reduced down to 200 grams. So what we're seeing here was when it was being reduced from um, a couple thousand to a couple hundred, uh, you know, that's about 90% efficiency. We're seeing it from a thousand to single digits or five digits to three digits. We're getting close to 99 plus uh, percent efficiency at our sites. And that's what our monitoring results are showing us for um, our Bell arrays over here at um, this, this club, uh, Bell Array site near the Johnson's Landing um, on the west side of the Salton Sea. Uh, moving on, um, so we, we also, the state is working on a predicted emissions model. And it's, I think it's based on similar data that IID Formation is using, um, their price pool data to help us uh, get emissions from our model. But I also believe our model is more conservative. Uh, is not as intricate as the formation model, which takes in a lot more different surface textures. I think ours mainly uh, ties everything as dry, so it's more of a worst case scenario. And where you can see here is that it's predicted that the areas that we're working in produce 384 tons per year. And this design efficiency is 90% is based on our design. So based on the Bell design, but also looking at the data that I just showed you, um, it kind of validates that. If not, we may be reducing it even more. So we're taking within our sites 380, 
four tons per year and reducing it to 38 tons per year. Um, that's a reduction of 345 tons a year coming from the, the product sites we're working on right now, which are um, which these total areas uh, account for 1,700 acres. And with that, I'm done. Um, if there's any questions, I think we're gonna get to that. And there's my email real quick. Thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you to other speakers. So we do have some time for questions. So, um, and thank you to all who have been slowly putting them in the chat and trying to um, collate them. Um, and then I'll have some we can walk through here. So um, the first question, which I, I actually may be, oh, suited a little bit to answer is, um, are there any ongoing or new compositional studies of particular matters? So um, I can comment on that part of what I did in my previous research was look at the composition for source apportionment. Um, but I don't know if any of our speakers today have knowledge of compositional measurements um, that are more recent or maybe longer term they could speak to. Yeah, uh, we just started doing that. Uh, th in fact, that video I showed kind of right behind me, we had a little instrument we were we were collecting dust, but we're primarily looking at dust that's coming off the desert and it's just um, relatively unexciting. It's um, <clears throat> the types of minerals that we're measuring. It's um, like iron oxides and quartz, um, feldspar. Um, and these are just basically the, the types of minerals you would expect to see um, anywhere in, in any type of desert. Um, and again, this is mostly what's coming more from the, um, like to the west of the Salton Sea in the Anza Desert. You know, at one point, uh, maybe a little bit of mercury as well, um, but that that's just uh, new work that we're doing right now, um, so. Right, you know, and, and to build on that, I think, you know, uh, IID has done some work that's been documented in 2017 and 2018, looking at heavy metal composition. Um, so basically, uh, <clears throat> looking at the um, uh, actual dust that's generated from the exhaust of the pie swirl. So not just the bulk soil samples, but really, you know, because of the processes of how um, the salt crust is created in terms of evaporate, you know, evapor concentration onto the, um, the surface and the salt crust that's it formed. Um, we've really focused on that and making sure that we analyze the dust uh, through XRF and uh, ICP on um, looking at heavy metals, uh, both from the playa as well as the desert. And what we found is that there's really no statistical significant difference between uh, heavy metal concentrations from the background or the desert area versus what we're seeing on the playa. And, and I think similar to some of the work that, that you've done, Alex, is, you know, we, we've um, hypothesized that it is that process of um, how the salt crust forms through evaporate, uh, evaporate minerals. Um, and that there's, there appears to be some kind of disconnect between what's measured in the soil and what's found in the dust. Yeah, that's that's very convincing. At least, uh, Brian, that you know, the salts are what's concentrating, not uh, you know, some not necessarily the metals or something. At least, not with the occurrence here, the knowledge of what we saw in our, my work. So, um, so there also had a question about. I think um, this is probably directed to Amato. Um, do you feel current um, dust suppression projects in place have helped reduce the probability of dust storms? If the, the question was if the if current dust mitigation activity is reducing the probability of dust storms. That that's the question. It was the answer. Probably uh, no. But, yeah, I mean, dust storms are gonna right. Yeah, dust storms are going to be occurring no matter what. I think. Um, so you know, the idea is that they're reducing the amount of dust that's emitted, and obviously that's what you know um, uh, was just talked about. The the only thing that I'll mention is that um, there's a. <clears throat> One thing that um, is possible is that as the Salton Sea shrinks, we're taking a, a relatively cold uh, surface, a relatively cool surface in the middle of that, that area, the Salton Sea, and we're, we're basically drying it out. We're replacing it with something that's very warm um, and, and very bright. So you take something that's cold and dark and replace it with something that's warm and bright and something that's quite large too, the Salton Sea. Um, there's a real potential that the meteorology, how those dust storms look, um, and their intensity 
And I think also how high the dust gets into the atmosphere might be changing. Um, that's something that I'm, I'm hoping we'll start to get a, a handle on over the next couple of years. Um, but uh, th that would be called a feedback kind of as far as, I don't know, just that that question made me think about feedbacks. And, and that's something that I would be maybe thinking about a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's a great can point. I, can, I, can I just jump in? Amano, could you just, could you speculate on a trend? Would that be more as the solency shrinks and it's a warmer surface? Is that um, a positive feedback loop or more of a negative feedback loop in terms of uh, severity of dust storms and potential uh, amounts of dust per minute? Yeah, so I mean, I could share a hypothesis um, and, and it would be an untested hypothesis. So, you know, there's the caveat. Um, but in the summertime, if if the, the Salton Basin in general, if we're, if we're taking out the, the sea, we are going to be warming that region up. So in the summertime, we would think that as, as the, the, the basin kind of warms up, as the Salton Sea dries up and, and as the basin warms, um, you know, I talked about those haboobs, that, that, that monsoonal circulation. One would expect that the monsoon would become a little bit more vigorous because there would be a larger temperature contrast between the land and the, and the ocean to the south. Um, and so that, in fact, would probably increase both the frequency and the intensity of, of summertime dust storms. In the winter season, it's a little bit trickier to um, figure that one out. And that, that's why it's not obvious to me that there, or I don't have a, there's not, a, I think, a, a reasonable hypothesis to make about how that might change the intensity of dust storms. It's potentially, they might be longer in duration. So they occur a little earlier in the day. Um, and that just has to do with, um, that just has to do with the uh, those wintertime storms being able to kind of get into the basin a little bit earlier in the day, but then also that those dust storms might be lifted up a little bit higher into the atmosphere. The reason why is because it, as the surface becomes warmer, um, essentially we get these vertical circulations that mix dust higher up into the atmosphere. And so if that was the case, you know, we could then also potentially see that maybe the dust storms start a little bit earlier, they have a longer duration, but potentially they're mixed higher up in the atmosphere, which would then reduce the surface PM concentrations. That's speculative, just kind of based on physical reasoning, totally untested. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing that I would add um, is, uh, you know, those meteorological phenomenon that Amato is talking about, even if they stay consistent with what they are right now, you're gonna continue to have, you know, wind and therefore dust from these other sources that are not associated with the sea. So our whole goal is, you know, to keep the sea uh, from becoming a big source. But right now, you know, all indications and all data generally demonstrate that the sea is not a huge source. So putting dust control measures to keep it from becoming a, a, a significant source is the whole goal of the program and what we're, I think, all striving to do. But that doesn't change the reality that these other sources that are really large around the Salton Sea are going to continue to, to um, you know, emit dust. Okay, Brian, so thanks for setting me up. So we had multiple questions um, along the lines of what mitigation efforts, if any, are being done, um, you know, in the off-road vehicle areas. So if we're talking about like over to your wells, where if you look at the modeling. Um, as well as thinking about, you know, why are the agricultural areas not being included in like that dust um, emission modeling? Um, so those are two separate questions. I think to anybody who has all dabbled in all of them. So um, is there any mitigation or control in the offer vehicle areas? And then what about the agricultural areas? Yeah. So I can't speak to, you know, the mitigation in the, um, you know, in the desert and off-road areas. Again, our whole goal is just to basically understand um, and have that as part of kind of understanding the bigger picture of the of one of the major sources and uh, the future source, which is the Salton Sea. What I can speak to is, you know, I think in all of these projects, especially on the playa, well, um, you know, when, when we look at those, we do consider um, off-road impacts on the playa surfaces. So um, generally trying to avoid having off-road impacts um, you know, in our project areas and on the ply in general um, makes all of our jobs easier because that uh, off-road impacts essentially break that fragile salt crust, create an opening for that wind to work on that and ultimately um, create a source area that can migrate and actually make the, you know, the ply more emissive. So um, a lot of our, uh, I think, projects out there are designed 
you know, generally to avoid having off-road impacts on the fire. Does anybody else want to comment on either of those agriculture areas or kind of dust management on that western so, side? Yeah, at least for off-road vehicles, what the state's doing in our projects is <clears throat> doing our best to kind of, you know, put up signs telling off-road vehicles to please stay off our site because they are active dust control sites and the, that dust off-road activity adds to it. And they've also gone as far as measures to kind of put, um, let's say, bumps in the row. We've taken some of the bells and kind of put them really close together and um, kind of hoping that'll prevent off-roaders from entering our site. And it seems to be um, proven pretty effective. But I mean, if they, you know, if someone wants to do get through, they'll take the time to get through. I would just like to, to throw in that definitely agricultural regions are, I mean, there are sources of dust, we would call that fugitive dust, you know, that's mainly dust coming from uh, dirt roads. But, um, you know, one can't but help wonder uh, how, you know, with the majority of the dust that's coming off of the desert regions, um, why do we put so much effort into the playa versus putting a lot more effort into the places where most of the dust is actually coming from? Um, and that's something I've thought about for quite some time now. And I, I don't know that there's a simple answer to that, but um, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the story of this region is that it's all impacted by people. I mean, whether it's agriculture, consultancy, or it's the that Western region. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated picture. So. Okay, um, so the next question I have. Um, so this goes a little bit into composition, um, but is anyone monitoring for contaminants in dust such as pesticides, heavy metals, um, or DDT? And Brian, maybe you kind of already answered this one a little bit. Um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, I think, you know, um, several folks, I think one, two, three, four, five. I, I have about six studies that I know of. Um, you know, both the work that you've done, uh, as well as uh, others from UC Riverside and uh, IID, some early work by uh, Vogel and Henry, you know, looking at the actual um, uh, sediment in the salt sea itself. Uh, so there's a variety of folks that have looked at it. Um, you know, I would say right now what, what, what we're doing is kind of looking at the body of literature that's out there and determining kind of uh, if there are some existing data gaps, um, that, you know that that could potentially be be addressed uh, with some additional sampling and, and understanding. So, um, but uh, yeah, mainly folks like you said from UC Riverside and and uh, IID has done a little bit of work on it. And it sounds like Amato is going to be doing a little more work moving forward. Anyone else want to comment on that question? Okay, um, so this one's a broader question. So thinking kind of big picture um, um, with the, how will California's water reduction commitment from the Colorado River impact or, ex, or exacerbate the just contribution to salt and sea? Do you guys foresee any impact on that? I know that there's already, yeah. Um, yeah, Jessica or Stephen, do you wanna take the first cut at that? Sure. Um, I mean, of course, it, with reducing conserving water in the ag fields is going to reduce the amount of water going into the ag drainage channels, which is um, really one of the main sources of water for the sea other than the Alamo and New Rivers on the south side. So with the reduction or more conservation in water, that's what we're going to see less water going to the sea. And with less water going to the sea, we're going to see a more rapid um, change or, you know, more rapid change in plant exposure. So that's what we'll see with um, these agreements that are going in place if the water is reduced is um, a more rapid reduction. But I also think that's why um, funding will come along with it to help us um, keep up with that pace. Yeah. My, my understanding. Oh, go ahead, Jessica. Oh, I was just going to build off what Stephen was saying is these agreements right now are at least looking at the next four years. What will happen after that? You know, that's still being worked on not only by IID, but other agencies, the state um, reclamation. Um, but we, yeah, we are looking into what sort of mitigation measures may be needed in funding from reclamation to implement them. And, and again, I, I think the work that's been done by the state, you know, Stephen is exactly right. It's going to 
increase the rate of exposure, but in terms of kind of total exposure, it's pretty consistent. Um, we just get there faster uh, with these with these changes, um, which is also you know an equal concern. But at the end of the day, I think there's only you know because of the, the symmetry of the sea, we get to that um, you know deeper area faster. But ultimately, the total exposure is not that different. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian, Jessica, and Stephen. Um, so the next question is towards Brian. So uh, the question is, your chart appears to indicate that emissions from Playa roughly doubled between 2016 and 2021. Um, so how do you, essentially the question is, how do you justify this um, when implementation was occurring during those times? So how do you explain how Playa emissions increased during implementation yeah. of mitigation? Great, great question. So uh, first, all of the emissions and emissions estimates are unmitigated, meaning we're essentially pretending that these um, uh, dust control measures that we talked about don't exist. So we look at, uh, we call that unmitigated uh, emissions. Um, and then, uh, so what that would be, you know, and, and that's helpful because that gives, you know, to Stevens, you know, some of the work that, that they're doing, that gives you an idea of if that project wasn't there, what would the emissions be uh, to help benchmark, uh, you know, progress. And so, uh, yes, unmitigated emissions, have not quite doubled, um, but they've increased. So we've gone from, you know, and I, I don't know if I can share my screen. This is in the emissions estimate. Um, uh, this is 2016 through 2021. This is, uh, I think, table six in the annual emissions estimate. This is tons per day instead of annual. Um, you can see both the desert and, and the playa, but it's gone from about 0.81 tons uh, per day to 1.7. We can't see it. Or can you guys see it? I can't see it. Oh. I can't share my Sorry. Uh, can you see this presentation? Yep, we can see it now. We can see your slide and yep, slide That's right here. Yep. So 0.81 in 2016 to 17 to um, uh, 1.7 in 2020, 2021. We're just about to come out with the 2021, 2022 numbers uh, in the next month or so. Um, so yes, they've they've increased. They've kind of bounced around, but they've increased mainly because there's more playa. Um, uh, but again, that is unmitigated. So at the at the end, then we put the measures on top. Look at the performance monitoring data from those, and then uh, uh, give a an estimate of the amount of emissions avoided because of those measures. Wonderful. Thanks, Brian. So the next question I have is for Stephen. Um, so there's a couple questions about um, the drilling and well program that are kind of the drilling for water to be used in mitigation, and it sounds like on the west side. Um, so for kind of the first part of the question is the drilling program for non-potable dust control measures only. Um, and then there's a kind of a statement slash question is, have you considered using you know, existing wells that have been abandoned because they're brackish. Um, so it sounds like from 100 years, it's a pretty long statement, but essentially there are, it sounds like there are abandoned brackish wells um, that are permitted in the in the region. Um, so have you considered using those? So, two questions. so the first question, um, we're developing wells for, for non potable use, um, yes. Um, and I, I don't think they could be used for potable use with the groundwater that's in the area. It's it's all got um, you know, salt in it that's not going to be conducive to human health. It's going to be the exact opposite. It's going to be detrimental to you. So these are going to be used to water our pale bit of desert plants that are really um, that they 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 like that salt water, and so it's going to help them them grow. Um, and then the second question: there are some groundwaters I've heard near the desert shore regions, which are quite far away from where our projects are at the moment. And one of the, and I'm sure people that are familiar and been following um, our projects is land access is, is one of our biggest stopping points. And if we're gonna, you know, do a pipeline over many properties, there's another, you know, access point. And as of right now, we're going go going forward. We are able to take advantage of the Salton City infrastructure, though they do have water sources there that we have been able to tap into at the moment. However, that is fresh water, and we want to get off of that because we want to leave that for for human consumption and get onto our wells. Yeah, I, I would just add real, real quick um, in terms of the wells that IID has, has drilled, you know, very 
uh, close to where the state is working as well. The aquifers that we are, you know, tapping into are in that seven to eight, pushing nine decimeters per meter. To put that into perspective, you know, Colorado River water is two. So it's not only not suitable for human consumption, but it's also not suitable for agricultural use. But our halophytic plants love it. It's always nice when the plants love it. <laughs> okay, so um, this is kind of this, this goes back to a little bit to what before this is the question that I had. So Stephen, you showed that you know the exceedances on the north end um, don't seem to be driven by playa. I think that was the subtext to what you were showing that it's a north northern wind driven exceedances. So can you talk a little bit again, talk I me mean, that about you know some of those dust sources north of the sea and what if any mitigation I know that's outside of some of the scope of this but I think it matters when we're talking about dust yeah and I think that kind of goes back to what Brian presented on the overall uh, water salt and sea watershed and where the dust emissions are coming from um, what the state is charged with is kind of counteracting the the dust uh, emissions that may be occurring from the quantification settlement agreement and the stipulated water order that goes along with that. So our focus is generally near the sea um, at the moment um, based on that water order. Um, but there are definitely um, based on um, models and and what we what we've seen from today that there are sources outside of the sea too that can be addressed. I guess a follow-up question to that. If it's not the responsibility of anybody in this room, um, do you, as a person who's in a state agency, do you have an idea of who's, you know, who is the regulatory responsibility for things like agricultural dust emissions? Maybe that's too deep and controversial. But... I, I'm not an expert on regulations, but I know the South Coast Air, Air District is a big portion of that area. And then there's also the Imperial County Air District, but there's, I think there's rules um, you know, for natural dust that's in the area. I mean, the desert's been there for, you know, since before, you know, times or, you know, however long it's been there. So, you know, trying to mitigate an entire dust or an entire desert, though, that's, you know, I don't know the cost of that either. Great point. Yeah. Okay. And we've had a few questions for you, again, Stephen, also as well. So can you talk a little bit more um, about the bale process? So there's a question is, can you explain more about the planting that is going on between the bales? And then how long will bales last? So I guess just tell us a little bit more about that mitigation technique. I think people would be interested in. Yeah, so <clears throat> the bells go in first to control the dust, you know, really stop the wind at the surface. And then we come in behind and start doing our plant installations. We're using drip irrigation right now. And on top of that drip, we're uh, within the bell array, we're using seeds. We, we've noticed um, as the weather gets warmer, seed germination really increases. And seed is a lot cheaper than plotted plants. Um, and but we've also used potted plants too outside the bell array um, just because outside the bell array there's less um, dust suppression there and we want to get those plants a boost to maybe instead of get getting mature in three years maybe we'll get ready in two years so we're, we're using all these other different techniques um, in between the bell array though we have rows every eight feet um, in order to meet that 90 percent um, reduction emissions that we're shooting for and also the 30 percent vegetation cover uh, we're planting every other row so about every 16 feet uh, within the bell array i don't know if there's any other questions i need to hit there i think yeah that's kind of describes it a little bit so did you say how long they will take to degrade i did not there you go okay. so the bells um i honestly at a minimum, uh, so it all depends. If if the bell loses twine, it pretty much degrades right, right away. It, it loses its structure and nothing's holding it together. So, and we do our best. If we start seeing that happen, we replace those bells. Uh, when, if the bell twine stays together and um, there's no issues there, these bells will last, I, I, I would say at least five years, maybe much, much longer. Um, there's been a lot of weather this year. So the bells got really wet. And the wind, the wind is bringing in lots of, of, of dust and with soil. So they're getting wet, they're getting soil. So they're kind of turning into a, a brickish material. They've definitely gained about 50 pounds each. Um, so they're not really easy to move anymore. Um, they're pretty solid there. Um, I see them, unless we start messing with them, they could be there for quite a while. Wonderful thing to see, Ben. So I think but, that... um, to add to that, that's not our intention. We do want to 
um, turn these sites from just bell sites to um, beautiful vegetation that people want to see. Looking at a great goal. So, so Mike, I think we we're said one thirty is about where we were going to call this, right? Um, we are. We have this available for another thirty minutes, depending on uh, your availability or schedules. There's still, I think, quite a number of questions, and it's been a pretty interesting and robust discussion. So, if you guys okay. are available, we can continue. Yeah, I'm available. If the speakers are so. Okay, so I have to. I haven't been clearing these questions as I've tried to get most of them. Um, and so, sorry, it's hard to try to balance reading your questions and bring them to the speakers at the same time. Um, I th there is some questions on um, talking about what would the impact of um, drying groundwater for these uses be on the hydrologic picture. So, kind of, um, could you revisit the groundwater picture and talk about you know what that drying the groundwater for mitigation purposes has on the hydrologic system. So just talking about like what impact, if any, you guys anticipate for drying groundwater. You want to go first, Stephen, or you want me to? I'm either, I think I don't, you know, I think we're a panel, so you can all talk about yeah. it. So. Yeah, all you guys, yeah, you're ready. Yeah, we, we talk about this a lot uh, between um, uh, the SACE project and IND's project. So in these ply environments, um, how they were created is, you know, over the years, different uh, depositional periods, when the lake was actually a lake, uh, brought fine sediments in, and then you have a period of desiccation, and, and this kind of goes on and on and on. And so you end up in a lot of these terminal playa basins having these aquitards or these um, thick clay layers in between sediment that bears water, and then you'll have another aquitard. Uh, that uh, really kind of disconnects the different aquifer systems deeper down from the surficial, like the, the aquifer that's feeding the, the vegetation. Um, so, you know, we don't want to, um, and the whole, you know, testing program that we're developing is really, uh, before we move to production, is really understanding those different layers um, so we're uh, generally uh, two layers below um, the surficial aquifer. So in a in a in a deeper system that's disconnected from the upper system, except on the fringe of the of the desert. Um, and uh, our goal is to test, so we can test pump from the deeper aquifer and look and see if there's any impacts uh, to the surface. Uh, before we move into that production phase. Uh, so that's that's first, you know, just kind of understanding the hydrogeologic system. The second thing is we're talking about really small amounts of water. Um, I think for most of these vegetation plants, not only can they use water that's less saline, they really don't need that much water uh, to get germinated. And then once they're germinated, they use both the soil moisture and then water and, and groundwater, that shallow groundwater that I mentioned, and water that you apply. So, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, anywhere from 50 to 70 gallons per minute um, during the daytime, uh, very small uh, pumping rates in that kind of 50 acre feet a year, right? Which is a really small number compared to, you know, say groundwater pumping in the Central Valley uh, where you're, you know, significantly, um, you know, you're pumping a significant amount of water for crop production. We're, we're really, um, Again, kind of one, understanding the system, two, testing the aquifer, and three, minimizing the amount of water we need by um, controlling our water balance and using the right kinds of plants. Brian, I guess to add on to that, what the state is doing, I mean, we're doing similar things. We're testing our aquifers, we're drilling, monitoring wells to go along with those production wells that we're installing. And we're also um, being very collaborative with IED at this point, sharing data, working on those aquifer tests together. And um, we can actually uh, monitor our wells while we're each doing our, our, our well tests and see how those are interacting. And to go along with interactions, we're actually working with our consultants right now to build a groundwater model to see if we can actually um, start um, Drawing, uh, modeling the interact, mo yeah. So, so we can start modeling the interactions of the solvency and the groundwater. 
and seeing how that affects. And then maybe we can draw on the other hydrology um, with rain and the river flows, and maybe we can have a full hydrologic model to see and get better predictions on what we'll see in the future of, of apply exposure and um, groundwater recharge and all those other issues. Stephen, um, so the next question I have, and I think it frankly outside of the expertise we have in the panel today. Um, is, so David Lowe, UC Riverside has identified a bacterial component um, in the Colton C. Imperial Valley. Some of the cases coming in from alfalfa bee farms, ranches in the Imperial Valley. Um, so this is in addition to the usual causes, of course, dust, dust toxic dust, pollen, molds. Um, do any of you have any comments on that? Or is that within, are you any of you familiar with that? And that's I thought may have been a little beyond your expertise as dust physics experts. And so I wanted to make yeah. sure you get it. Be a good question for Dr. Lowe. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I don't well, know if we've had Dr. Lowe before, Mike, but he's uh, so I'll just jump in and I'm hoping one of our, our plan is to have a public health webinar in the next several months. And my hope is to get Dr. Lowe on that panel to specifically address these kind of questions. So stay tuned. Great, wonderful. It's always nice when there's a follow-up that says we're going to do more. So, um, otherwise, so we have some. I think there's a question about here. I think the answer is from this. Just going back to agricultural emissions, I think this panel is not prepared to give you great answers on agricultural emissions, and I think that um, the sounds like the air quality district would be maybe better positioned um, to discuss that question. Um, and then there's just a comment about you know that. There has been observations of contamination in the sediments from coming from the USGS. And so I think um, the kind of scientific question I think Brian touched on a little bit is whether or not that contamination ends up in the air. And so, and if it's these crusts that are emitting, it's a little bit different than if it's actually these contaminated sediments. And I think that's a standing question um, that, you know, there's been some evidence between, you know, what IED has done and, you know, what I actually did that says, you know, there's not a ton of trace metals, for example, in what we're seeing in the dust, but less work, I think, on the pesticide side for some of those things. Um, hey, Alex, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. The one thing that, that we haven't necessarily touched on is uh, climate change and the effect of climate change on how all of these plans look. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, everybody, we, we know that as the climate changes, the planet gets warmer, but there's actually this other really robust result or, or thing that we know is that as the, as the planet gets warmer, arid regions become more arid. Um, and so that puts on uh, extra additional stresses on, on uh, vegetation, um, and that also dries out soil moisture. Um, so in addition to all that, as we think about kind of the future of the salt and sea in the next 20, 30, 40 years, it's actually going to probably become an environment that's more well suited for dust storms to occur. I'd be curious to know if, if Brian or Steven have any um, thoughts or um, how that might factor into kind of planning, or if it does at all, because it's too long of a horizon, time horizon. It is a long time horizon. I think, you know, it's a good question. The other thing that I think also potentially happens is you might have more frequent um, and uh, bigger monsoonal events that not only bring, um, you know, the the, the wind and the haboobs that you talked about, but also bring uh, flash flooding. You know, we're seeing this in Eastern Sierra. We're seeing this in this area. This last year, we saw a couple 100 year events, both in uh, portions of the Salton Basin, as well as in, um, you know, the Owens and Coso uh, area. And those influences are one, you know, how do you uh, plan to have more frequent, Flash floods coming into your um, into your facilities, and to, to and not have them ruin your facilities or your vegetation, or bring more sediment that piles up on top of everything, uh, and creates a, a new dust source. Or, or two, how do you then also use that water um, uh, from those events? Because it is in a lot of areas, it's the only source of water. Uh, how, how do you use that uh, effectively if you can? How do you harness it? Um, those are, I, I guess, I've been thinking about that more from. The mitigation side and on but your question on what does it mean for overall kind of climate and emissions into the future i think is a, is a is a good open hypothesis that needs to be investigated 
Yeah, and I'll say we're pretty much on the same uh, note. You know, there's, you know, we're expecting, you know, to get warmer, drier, so maybe more evaporation. Maybe we'll see the sea recede more, or maybe we'll see more monsoons. We'll see more weather. I mean, this last year we saw a good amount of rain down in the, the desert. Um, and who knows, maybe we'll see that, maybe that'll be the new regular in the future. Uh, we don't know. But we do want to try to plan to take advantage of uh, water if it is going to come onto our sites. And as you can see behind me, there's little swells um, next to some of our bells with with uh, some plants. So we do we do plan on trying to utilize whatever nature can provide for us as much as possible. Yeah, great, great to hear, Stephen, and thank you, Romano, for that question. So I guess I have a question that's kind of something that I'm always interested in. We talk about playa and dust emissions, so. Um, I guess almost every time I visit the Salton Sea, even if I visit the same site and I was looking at Playa, the surface characteristics were often dramatically different. Um, and I imagine you guys have all viewed that when you were so um, Brian, when you talk about doing those pie swirl measurements, I imagine those were point in time. I don't know if you guys like went out to the same site multiple times. So. Yeah. We've gone to the same site for since 2016 in a lot of cases. Okay. We've extended them. Generally, what we try to do is transects down the playa in representative areas of our different domains around the playa. And so we've certainly extended those transects, but generally we've, you know, since 2016, 17, we've been going back to the same areas um, on a monthly basis within okay. the dust season, right? So you're kind of capturing, when you're talking about these monoliths, you are capturing that kind of seasonal variation. Absolutely. Sense. It's the first thing, you know, that you, yeah. like you said, you see, and you're like, well, if I want to understand and quantify these emissions, I have to be able to quantify that temporal variability. Because mm -hmm. you're right, you can, you know, some soils respond if, if you don't have like fine textured soils where you get that capillarity and get a nice salt crust. Um, those can be, uh, uh, you know, those can change based on changes in shallow groundwater, changes in precipitation. Um, whereas the ones that, uh, the soils that are, you know, more coarser textured throughout the, the profile, um, those, that capillarity is broken so the water isn't coming up to the top as much. And you'll get more kind of consistent surface properties and emissions from those areas. Great to hear you're seeing that too, because that seems in my mind that makes sense. I feel like I always kind of thought that as we looked down there. And so awesome to hear you're incorporating that. We basically created a whole like classification system, very much very similar to like soil survey, but for the surfaces. Yeah. So characterizing the, the the kind of driving factors of the emissions, you know, how how thick the surface is. How you know hard it is? If there's a subcrust, uh, how thick is that? How dry is it? Um, and try to kind of integrate that into our our mapping of sources. Well, that sounds like a ton of work. So, <laughs> so. Um, otherwise, we have a question. So this is again getting a little afield. I think where some of you have your expertise. So um, shifting to algae blooms. So we know that there is you know a very, it's a very eutrophic lake. Um, and there is consistent algae blooms, I think, nearly year-round, which is a little abnormal. Um, and so does that affect the particular map? Um, and so the question is, because of algae blooms, do the communities near the Salton Sea experience different particular matter composition? Um, and so, and I, and I guess I maybe, I, so the Salton Sea does affect the composition itself. There is sea spray. Um, that effect that's it's not maybe not a very important when we talk about you know these giant dust sources but there's definitely sea spray sources um and likely things that come from algae blooms and that end up in the dust i don't i don't think i can say specifically how that affects the um, toxicity but you know algae blooms are things that are established to be some that have toxic um, compounds in them so i think there is you know you could draw a line there but whether there's evidence to support some things i think is an open question so but if a panelist want to talk to that those of you who are still actively down there working on these things, that'd be great. Yeah. To me, it, it is something that, that should be looked at. Um, uh, it's something that we have noticed, you know, when we're out there doing these um, annual surveys or these monthly surveys of, of ply emissions and, and surface characteristics, is that at times you can see, um, you know, just kind of qualitatively, anecdotally can see you know, algae mixed into the crust. Um, uh, but I think, you know, in terms of a focus study, I'm not aware of any focus studies, but that to me would be, you know, an area that um, on the research institution side would be a good question to, to look at. And I do think David Lowe may have actually done some stuff 
with I thought he did, and he presented that at the summit last year. Yeah, so. Yeah, he and uh, Will Porter at UC Riverside as well, I think are starting to explore that. I think that research is ongoing, but some of those publications are probably gonna be coming out in the next year or two. And we can carry this question over for their public health or the, whatever the public health webinar went up. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I think what we're, what we're kind of, one of the conclusions of today is it's a very complicated system and, you know, justice, the salt and supply of dust is one component of, you know, these algae blooms and nearby dust sources are also quite important. So, um, so I think that has most of the questions I have in the chat. Um, we covered, I think I have my stock questions, I believe, were mostly covered. Um, does anybody else want to put any comments? Um, I just want to point out that I, I did answer some questions as I typed, um, so they may have gone away. I know Tom had some questions, and there were other questions that I think did come back, and we did answer, like, the veg, and, but the Tom's questions, um, stepped in, if they're still there. So I want to make sure, so I know he's pretty active, but he had questions relating to uh, whether or not, you know, I, or how much water we need to use to sustain our plants in the future. And my answer to, was to, to that is that we're hoping to only use water um, to establish our plants. And then after that three to five year period, we're really hoping to pull off the water and um, hoping these plants really survive on their own, tapping into the groundwater underneath. These plants should have some exceptional tap roots to help them survive is really the hope there and, and the theory behind all this. Thanks for catching that, Stephen. Um, yeah. If anybody else saw questions that I missed, please feel free to answer them. Um, or if I skipped your question, you can stick it back in there as well. Um, uh, there's a question, I think this goes into, we should talk to David Lowe. So, um, so far, the cyanotoxins in the salt sea water column have not risen above the cash, caution level, but there is a question about what happens when they drop cyanotoxins dry out. So um, sea spray, again, um, cyanotoxins are, are of interest. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that as well, but I think we're gonna um, leave that for David Lowe. So. <laughs> Okay, um, any other comments or questions from our panelists that you'd like to address before we call it a day? Um, well, then I will say thank you and I'll hand it back to Mike. I don't know if you wanna say any closing words. Yes, so I particularly wanna thank you, Alex, for moderating this panel um, from afar. Minnesota is very different from the, the Salt and Sea, but I'm <laughs> very glad we brought you back in. Great to be uh, back, I like it, I love it. So. Well, maybe we'll rope you in again. Uh, and many thanks to our panelists, Fumato and uh, Jessica and Brian, to Stephen uh, for their excellent presentations. And I think for a very robust and informative conversation. Um, there's been a lot of questions uh, over the years about the amount of dust being produced, how that dust moves through the system, how dust even is generated. Um, and I think this, uh, so this webinar has been recorded. And I think it's gonna be a really useful resource for people to go back to and to, to explore some of these answers. So uh, again, many, many thanks to you guys for giving up your time, quite a bit of your time, uh, to participate in this webinar. And I'd also like to thank Carlos, who I think has been speaking nonstop for two hours interpreting this, uh, and uh, a lot of technical terms, and um, some of you guys are speaking pretty quickly, and I, from what I can hear, he's done a really excellent job of, of interpreting. So thanks for uh, to Carlos as well. Um, again, this webinar has been recorded, will po be posted on the Pacific Institute website at PacInst org slash videos that should be up in the next day or two and stay tuned for our next webinar which should be uh, on public health and there's been actually just a week or i guess it was just last week there was an interesting article came out in nature about uh, salt and sea loading uh, water loading and its impacts on seismicity in the san andreas fault so with luck we can rope some of those authors in and maybe some other um, geologists to talk about influence of uh, salt and sea levels on on seismicity in the region so again, many thanks to all for participating in this and to all the participants for some really excellent questions uh, and stay tuned for our next webinar. Thanks all.